In January 2023, Peter Ball, who is a middle distance Australian runner, was provisionally suspended for EPO after returning a sample that presented elevated levels of exogenous EPO, or as it might be referred to as recombinant EPO, aka man-made. Now, if you're lucky enough to have been tested by WADA, you'll know that your sample is split into two vials from your initial sample, whether that's blood or urine. This is the infamous A and B sample. The A sample is always tested first, and the B sample remains sealed forever, unless of course some Russian KGB agents open it, or more commonly, the athlete wants some retesting done. Peter elected to have his B sample tested shortly after, and incredibly, his B sample returns an atypical finding, meaning it was neither positive or negative. Now you might wonder, how can this be? And we'll get to that in a minute. This so rarely happens, most athletes don't even bother having their B sample tested, as it so rarely returns anything different from the A sample. This makes sense logically, given that the original sample is split into two, and there should, in theory, if all is followed to the letter, should be no differences in the results from the A and B sample. Peter Ball reported to his Instagram that it was a false positive, like he said all along, and he's been exonerated. After the positive test from the A sample, when Peter had his B sample tested, he employed the help of two different teams to independently analyze with his legal team the results of his testing. The first report by Professor David Chen at the University of British Columbia noted that the lab should have immediately recognized issues with the testing and followed the procedure described in the WADA technical document. Chen identified that another obvious phenomenon should have been noticed but wasn't is the intense band. Now, if you're wondering what the intense band is, we'll also get to that in just a minute. Observed on one of the samples. Research has shown that people who have recently taken synthetic EPO do not have high levels of naturally occurring EPO. We'll get to that in a minute as well. The gel pattern showed very strong natural EPO intensity indicating that it did not come from a person who recently used synthetic EPO. The research was also critical of the poor quality of the standards. Chen concluded the report finding a positive result was improper and did not meet their criteria by the WADA technical document. A second report was published by Norwegian researchers. The report said we have carefully evaluated the documents that report the tests performed on Peter Ball's A sample and found no scientific evidence in the document which proves the presence of synthetic EPO in Ball's urine. According to the letter from Ball's lawyer, the SAA should drop the case. The case then inevitably was dropped. So why is this case so strange and why might this have some very large implications for other athletes who have tested positive for EPO, who are currently taking EPO, and who might test positive in the future for EPO. And I know a lot of you watching this immediately are bringing to mind the CEO of EPO, Lou Zhao Zhun, and will he avail of any of the recent revelations from this testing? The problem with EPO is that it's very unique when we're trying to detect if someone has been doping with EPO or erythropoietin as it's known. When we test for other performance enhancing drugs, for example, anabolic steroids, usually what happens is the athlete ingests the anabolic steroid via injection or orally or suppository, and they metabolize this pharmaceutical drug. From this metabolism, there is things known as metabolites or little sections of the drug that has been broken down, chemically altered via the body's metabolism, and they present as very distinct patterns when analyzed using a variety of different analyst machines in laboratories that are accredited by WADA. You'll see these very distinct pictures, metabolites that would never appear in an athlete's blood or tissue or sample or urine unless they had ingested knowingly or unknowingly a exogenous steroid, um, whether that's Winstrol or testosterone or any number of performance enhancing drugs that you've probably heard the names of before. EPO is quite different and it has been and probably will be for quite a while quite notoriously difficult to test for. Now EPO or retropoietin has been used by athletes since approximately the 80s and the technology used to test for EPO or the methods used in the lab have remained quite similar. The technology is advancing a little bit in terms of software and hardware but the base principles remain the same for detection of EPO. Now due to the nature of EPO 
the test used to test if someone has used exogenous EPO versus having naturally high levels of endogenous EPO or naturally produced EPO make it quite difficult due to the nature of the test and how the results are presented. So there's a couple of different things we need to cover here. First of all, what does that gel pattern mean? Do false positives actually happen for EPO? And can someone really have seriously high levels of natural EPO? Let's get to the third one first, and this is kind of a simpler one to think about. The fact that he has naturally high levels of EPO does not necessarily mean from his test that he actually wasn't doping with PEDs for EPO. What that means, or potentially means, is that he was just using something known as an exogenous stimulator of EPO. So you might not necessarily have been taking the direct hormone erythropoietin, but you can be taking something known as a PDH inhibitor. What a PDH inhibitor is normally used for is for people with very low levels of red blood cells. This stimulates the production or it mimics a hypoxic environment or a low level of uh, oxygen environment in the body's tissues. When the body's tissues experience a low level of oxygen, they naturally produce a series of processes that result in higher levels of red blood cells being used hopefully to make the levels of oxygen in the blood higher via a larger number of red blood cells. And a lot of athletes use this, both performance-enhanced athletes and potentially natural athletes to improve aerobic performance, nutrient partitioning, potentially recovery, and ability to perform a number of repetitions per set or per game. So having a very high level like we talked about in this particular band of endogenous EPO, could in itself actually be a red flag due to the nature of exogenous stimulating hormones or pharmaceuticals that would produce higher levels of endogenous EPO. Now, when we're testing for EPO, there's kind of two different categories that we could look at. One is the indirect method and the other is the direct method. EPO and the anti-doping of EPO has been studied for decades and this problem has been consistently arising up until this very day when there's even research published this year trying to further refine the methods. So the indirect method for testing of EPO looks at hormonal markers or blood markers or biological markers around the use that would present itself when someone takes exogenous EPO. This is looking at things like hemoglobin, hemocrit, uh, soluble transfer receptors, just serum EPO, and several other things that we don't necessarily need to get into right now. But due a variety of different statistical analysis, this will present itself in the blood markers, usually in the athlete's biological passport. So their current sample will be compared to previous samples taken from their biological passport. And you might see a couple of problems with that already. You might say, what if they'd always taken EPO and their biological passport was always their baseline? And the answer to that is yes, that does happen. And the biological passport is essentially a pile of nonsense, but it's still a cheaper way of testing for potential EPO victims or people who've been using EPO than testing in the direct method. So they will use some statistical analysis from these blood markers, compare them to baseline populations and the athletes, if they have a biological passport on system, compare it to that and see does this flag for the potential use of exogenous EPO. Now there's quite a number of studies done on this, looking at the consistency of, and the reliability of the statistical analysis of these markers, where patients or control groups or athletes are given erythropoietin, they are known to certain number of the study organizers, and then these are given to different labs, or they're in this lab, everyone knows what's going on, and then they try to analyze them based on the statistical analysis from their blood markers. We've got three different studies on this currently that I could find, and they vary massively in their reliability and reproducibility on catching someone. So one of them was between 94 to 100% reliability on catching someone if they were using exogenous EPO. Uh, in this case, for example, one of the 189 returned a false positive. A different one, a different analysis returned a 67 to 72% reliability of catching someone uh, using exogenous EPO based on these biomarkers. And then the most unreliable one was 57.5% reliability of catching someone using, of using exogenous EPO. Now, you might think the first one is very, very reliable, uh, but I think there's a bit more to that that probably would reduce those values a bit more than 94%. 
the other two seem to be a bit more reliable in how accurate these bio biomarker testing actually are. So if we take the least reliable one, 57%, so that's nearly, not quite, but nearly one in two, people could be using erythropoietin. You could be tested while using EPO and not flag in the system based on the analysis from that. So you might think, okay, so the indirect method of testing for EPO isn't great. It might also respond or result in me getting a false positive, which is definitely not good and might be the case here in Peter Ball's case. Uh, so where do we go from there? So then we have to go towards some direct testing, actual analysis of the erythropoietin in the athlete's bloodstream or tissues or urine. So get into a little bit of the details of the direct testing methods. There is a whole lot to the actual analysis of erythropoietin in tissue. When you're testing these samples, there's no point kind of sugarcoating it or pretending that we can make it more simple. The actual multi-step process used in testing for EPO is hugely complicated, very unreliable, based huge amounts on the, anal the analyst's experience, uh, their equipment at hand, the reagents they're using, and depending how they're feeling that day and if they're willing to be super diligent, the verific verification process after that. Uh, any of you who've worked in labs or gone to university or doing a PhD will know methods that use SDS page, Western blotting, capillary extrapheresis, and a couple other related methods will know that it's incredibly difficult and has been since the initial EPO testing has been done. So here's a little um, section from the Journal of Physiology produced. This was in 2008 the problems were arisen and have not really been cleared up since. So the test requires a 700 to 1000 fold concentration of the specimen before analysis can be carried out and the concentrated urine forms a pellet that is difficult to solubilize. Despite this enormous concentration factor, up to 20% of the investigated samples did not show detectable EPO. So this is from knowing that the samples all took EPO, one in five of them could not be shown to actually have exogenous EPO in the sample. One in five, which is crazy. EPO test results are clearly not always interpreted identically, and the use of the software processing has been criticized. The American WADA Credit Laboratory has performed a direct test on EPO on more than 2,600 samples, this was in 2008, only nine of them were found to be positive. The low numbers of athletes caught by the test are somewhat contradictory to the overall increase of mean hematocrit values since recombinant human EPO became available. So this is what we're talking about with the indirect testing, that they've seen these values increasing, but they just can't catch athletes taking EPO. Additionally, in some high profile legal cases in the United States, Athletes who are clearly doping with a variety of compounds include EPO past hundreds of individual drug tests. Along these lines, uh, Ludby et al. convincingly demonstrated that the performance of the urinary EPO test is somewhat disappointing. Although the judgment process of real doping cases differs from one applied in the present study, the high number of false negative results imply a risk that athletes doping with EPO will avoid detection and damage the fundamental goal of fair competition. The earlier reported flaws of the test helped understand the relatively low efficiency of the direct EPO test and the current results emphasize the need for improving EPO testing. Now, what these researchers are currently looking at is something that looks basically like this. And this is where that strong gel band comes into. Now, the base principle on how a Western blotting and other similar styles or similar category of testing for a retropoidin works is basically a different charge is applied after a certain number of chemical steps that exogenous EPO has a different charge to endogenous EPO. But this is not always the case and it's not always consistent and it depends heavily on the method used and is still to this day very, very difficult to reliably reproduce. And it's what researchers are currently trying to look at is make it cheaper and much more efficient. Now, when you're looking at metabolites from different steroids, for example, performance, other performance enhancing drugs, you get things that look like this. They're very, very easy to interpret. The machine does a lot of the work if the prep is done correct and the machine is maintained correctly. Unfortunately, this cannot be used 
this particular machine, say for example, if you've heard of uh, LCMS or mass spectrometry machines, cannot be used, which are some of the most finely analytical machines you get in the industry. They're valued at between 500 to 1.5 million euros per machine. They are very reliable if used correctly and cannot be used because due to the process, endogenous and exogenous EPO look the same on these machines when resulted. So we're left with using these gel patterns. Now, if you're wondering where the word gel comes from, it's essentially this kind of block that these bands are present in are dye maintained on this gel. A charge is applied through this gel and then it drags down these molecules and they stop at different places based on their particular charge. And the hope is that you've reference standards of what you know exogenous and endogenous EPO should look like and then what this athlete sample looks like and hopefully the athlete sample lines up with the endogenous EPO if they haven't been taking it and hopefully you end up with accurate testing. However, this is very inconsistently the case. So in Peter Ball's case, there is a lot going on. It really is impossible to say only he knows if he truly is a clean athlete. So his A sample returned as a positive for EPO but his B sample returned as neither positive or negative pretty much because it was very hard to interpret what was going on. Now, I don't know the particular procedures used in these particular labs. So this lab was in Australia. From what I know of the Australian lab and from what I've heard, and I know some people who actually work with some people there or know them through acquaintances and they seem to be quite competent people. What seems to have happened here was some level of incompetency happened or mistakes were made during the process or the testing process that resulted in this result being presented as the final result. So the A sample returned a positive, which then led to the Peter Ball being contacted. But probably what really got messed up here was the B sample testing, neither positive or negative, was likely an issue in the presentation of results. And realistically, this B sample probably shouldn't have been reported or the investigation into the method done should have been investigated and if possible, a repeat test should have been done. Now, I assume there's a whole load of legality around repeat testing if there's found to be issues in the analytical method when the person was doing the retesting of the B sample. I would imagine all results have to be reported to the athlete. And in this case, Peter Ball might, or Peter Ball might, be a clean athlete and he might never have taken any exogenous EPO and he might be a clean athlete and this false positive which we do happen and we've seen happen from these studies may actually be the case. What also could be the case and I have no opinion on either way what could also have been the case is that he was taking EPO but due to the nature of the EPO testing or the retropoidin testing being so complicated and so inconsistent and somewhere somebody possibly made this a little bit worse in the laboratory analysis, the analyst messed up that day to a certain extent when testing the B sample and left us with some murky waters. They may have had to present the B sample. Someone might have interpreted the results wrong and, you know, maybe, maybe fairly or unfairly were uh, villainized for interpreting those results in that particular fashion. So EPO is quite unique in this nature and it remains to be seen if anything different will come from this and other athletes can avail of it given the finicky nature of this. Uh, it would be very easy if you were a subject matter expert to argue against this in multiple different fashions if you understood the methods very well, if you understood things like ELISA methods, if you understood the capillary extrapheresis, STS page, western blotting, if you understood these methods really well and you were paid enough money you could really dig into this and if someone was able to provide you enough funding to talk through this EPO and tear it down, you could potentially, uh, unless it's super clear and the relevant subject experts at these labs are also incredibly competent, which I have to imagine there, would have to have talked back to you. But then depending on the person making the decision, it could go either way. And it seems like in this case, Peter Ball either was exonerated fairly or got very, very lucky based on the legal team he employed. Either way, very, very interesting case. It's crazy how we're at this stage with EPO, and it's unlikely to change further unless this technology improves massively or someone really refines the method used to test for erythropoietin. Very interesting case. Hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, it remains to see if any other athletes, people like Luz Arjun, could genuinely 
potentially benefit from this. So in legal cases, a lot of time precedent makes a big difference. Now, fair sports or uh, the court of arbitration for sport very rarely go back in decisions made by national governing bodies. I think the court of arbitration resides in Switzerland because it's neutral or whatever. And oftentimes athletes will take it that far. I know Ilya, I think, went there with his cases, but he had like four positive cases for the same drug. So it's unlikely he was ever going to get away with it, no matter how good his legal team. But I would wonder, were China trying to maintain the medals that Lu Zhaozhen has won, would they try and uh, end up, you know, trying to clear his name or do they really care anymore? It's a huge process. It definitely costs a lot of money. And it looks worse if, in the end, you're still found guilty. So, very interesting case from Peter Ball. And he is off to the Worlds this year. Again, no no opinion on my part. I literally have no idea. It's up to you to decide if you think elite level athlete was doping with a reach or uh, Based on this, uh, as far as everyone else is concerned, he wasn't doping. And that might be the end of the matter unless he tests positive again. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you have any questions, please don't ask me in the comments because uh, testing for EPO is in depth. But I will leave a lot of the research, relevant research for anyone who wants to read it. And any uh, lab analysts who also want to go through it and get some PTSD can also look at it. Thanks for watching, guys, and I hope you enjoyed the video.